morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mountain View Church of Christ. It's good to be with the Lord's people, especially during this weather event. Amen. <laughs> A special welcome to any visitors we may have this morning. We will begin our worship together with a reading from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises. Now please stand as we sit. Thank you, Treva. And along those same lines, a passage from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he has given us his very great and precious promises. Let's stand on those promises. And let's sing number 410. Let's do the first, second, and fifth verses of Standing on the Promises. I am resolved. Let's do the first, second, and fifth verses of number 566.
communion. Let's turn over to number 312. Calvary covers it all. Let's sing the first and last stanza of number 312. <laughs> Corinthians reminds us this is a time for cross-examination. Examine is a word that's often used in the court proceedings. And examination can be defined as putting yourself under evaluation, like, like with a microscope. This type of examination is for our own good, like when we visit the doctor, some examinations are done with great care and great precision. The word examine is found only twice in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 11.28 and then in 2 Corinthians 13.5. The word examine is from the Greek word dokimatso, meaning to test literally or figuratively by implication to approve. Cross-examination is another term that's used in our court proceedings. A witness is cross-examined by a lawyer. The word picture of cross-examination, I think that's an appropriate word as a communion illustration. Communion is a time for cross-examination, a time to look at ourselves from the cross's point of view. During communion, we should examine our hearts and we should discern which emotions are found there that maybe should be removed. One of the worst is to find and to remove bitterness of heart. The Bible calls it unforgiveness. Proverbs 14.10 says, Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. 
We need to examine our hearts to see if there's unforgiveness for any person in our life. Before we take communion, we need to make sure we've forgiven the people that have hurt us. And no doubt, we've all been hurt. First Chronicles 29 verse 17 says, I know, my God, that you test the heart and you are pleased with integrity. Jeremiah, over in the 11th chapter, verse 20, he says, But, O Lord Almighty, you who judge righteously and test the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. So to examine yourself doesn't mean to beat yourself up. Examine can be just defined as putting yourself under God's microscope. And 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven says, people can take communion in an unworthy manner. I believe this can occur when people take communion without self-examination. An action which, at least according to verse 29 and 30, has some dangerous implications. To examine yourself this morning, I just say, ask these questions. Is there someone I need to forgive? What is it that's preventing me from forgiving them? Is there someone whom you should seek forgiveness? Why haven't you sought his or her forgiveness? Communion is the perfect time for cross-examination. As you and I cross-examine ourselves, we open our hearts for God to cross-examine us. And with those thoughts in mind, Jesus asks us to do this in remembrance him. The loaf, again, I remind you, represents his body, his life lived out in serving the will and the desires of the Father. The cup, representing his blood, the price that was paid to ratify this new agreement, this new covenant with the Father. With that, let's ask God's blessing on this communion. Let us pray. <clears throat> kind and loving Heavenly Father, we just come to you at this time, wish to thank you for the fact that you sent your Son to earth to teach us what we should live, what we should do. Lord, we, we thank you that you saw that we needed to self-examine to see whether we were in the right frame of mind to partake of this table that you have instituted to help us to remember what your son lived through this loaf his body, his teachings, but also that we need to examine ourselves and make sure that we are in the right frame of mind, free of bitterness, knowing where we fall short, where we need to strive better, because we know that we're unworthy of the blood that was shed for us on the cross. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together, that we can remember the sacrifice that your son made for each and every one of us. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
I look at things differently sometimes. And uh, I've had people ask me over the years, being in banking, that, well, do you play golf? <laughs> no. Why don't you? I just don't. Well, what's your hobby? Well, I kind of like farming. Oh, you farm? No, I play. <laughs> I watch the farmers when I married into a farming family. They farm, I play. But I said, I enjoy that. Why don't you like golf? <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. I played a long time ago, but you know, I'm, I'm always chasing a little white ball. <laughs> I said, well, what are you doing farming? I said, well, you plant stuff and you do that. Well, you're just putting stuff in holes, same thing as golf, you're putting a golf ball in a hole. I said, well, there's something, there's a big difference though. I said, I get to eat what comes out of the hole. I said, and I get to see the, the reward that God provides mm -hmm. for the labor that I put into it. I said, not saying that you don't get at that out of golf, but you know, the fact of the matter is, you get to see the rewards that God has made based on your investment. It's not anything that we did. He's just shown us how. And if we do what he asks us, then we'll reap the rewards. I'm sure there's rewards in golf. You can probably ask Tiger Woods, Honor Palmer, and all like that, and they can tell you the rewards of it. But all that being said, why do you work? We don't work for fame or fortune. Some people do, but I think they've got it misplaced. We need to work for God's glory. Mm. And if we can, if we put God's glory first in our work, then everything comes second hand. We're just, we're asked to be good stewards of what God's entrusted to us. And that's what we should all strive for. We have an opportunity at this time to return a portion of what God's entrusted to us back to him through our offerings. And those offerings not only support the church here, but they also reach out into our community, into the nation, and into the world to help spread God's word throughout. And that's what it's all about. So we'll take this opportunity to pray over the offering and you have an opportunity to do so at any time during the service. So let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all the blessings that you pour out upon us. And we thank you for allowing us to be stewards of what you've entrusted to us. We know and understand that all of it belongs to you. We're not the keepers, or we are just the keepers. We're not the owners. Lord, we thank you for that privilege that we have, and we ask that what our tithes and offering come back to you, that you would bless them tenfold and let them show your love and glory throughout the world. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. So at this time, we're not going to have uh, children's church tonight, or today. So uh, at this time, we're going to turn it over to Carl. Good morning. Thank you all for braving the cold temperatures. And if, uh, if you see me shaking up here, it's not because I'm nervous. I'm flat freezing. <laughs> so, so anyway... Um, so, some people have, have mentioned, and it's been brought to my attention that I, in more than one direction, that sometimes I go too fast and I don't give people time to get to the scriptures, and 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 um, and some people have given up on that idea of try, even trying to keep up. But I'm going to try to do better and make sure you guys have time to turn to the scriptures. And this morning we uh, are going to be looking, and yes, that's accurate there, Acts 1 through 4. No, we're not going to read the entire thing. We're going to be looking at highlights through there um, to answer the question, how does Christ build his church, uh, which is the um, title of the message, how Christ builds his church. And so we'll be looking at Acts 1 through 4, um, and uh, we'll be opening up the scriptures. And there will be, depending on the message, there will be more or less scriptures to turn to, depending on the week and what I have to present. So... Um, with that being said, before we open the Word of God, or as you're opening the Word of God, let's go to Him in prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise that you are a good and awesome God. 
We thank you that you provide for us. Thank you that your word is clear, that there's many, many parts that are easy to understand and sometimes hard to implement. And I just pray that we would be faithful to implement what we know and what we can understand. Be with us this morning as we look at your word, that we would know how that Christ builds the church and that we would be uh, participants with him in that. And I just guide my words that they would be what you want said and open each and every heart, uh, that they would hear the message that you want heard. And so we give you the praise and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, before we get to that, as um, in order to, you know, we are the Christian churches, churches of Christ, are part of what is known as the Restoration Movement. And the, the whole goal of the Restoration Movement is to restore the church to as close as it can possibly be to what it was in the New Testament. That's, that's the, the whole motive behind that movement. And one of their sayings is that we do Bible things in Bible ways. And so restoring something, there, there's, there's restoring something that, that it, back to its original, and then there's taking an original and modifying it. There's, there's a difference between those two things, and, and I got a picture for you to help you understand the difference. Do we have that picture? We don't have the picture. Oh. See, that's why I have to learn how to do PowerPoint, so I can, so I can have those things. But we don't have the picture. You have an original... In your mind, imagine a beautiful 1932-34 Ford pickup truck that are restored to its original condition. And then you have what, I don't know if anybody are familiar with what is called a rat rod. But a rat rod is not restored, it's highly modified, and it looks to me like modified junk rolling down the road. And so we, I, we, that's the difference between restoring and modifying. You have to know what the original looks like in order to restore it. If you don't know, then who's to say that the rat rod isn't the right thing? Who's to say that that, that version of it isn't right? And so we, um, in order to restore the church, we have to know what the original one looked like. And the best place that we can find that out is in the book of Acts. That's where we find the original. And we can look at that and we can know and we can say, okay, what was it like? And how can we strive to be more like that? Or as much like that as we possibly can in our day and age. So we are going to go to the book of Acts, and we're going to start off in chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about what Jesus began to do and to teach. And does anybody know who the I is here in my former book? That would be Luke. Luke wrote the, the Gospel of Luke. He's also the author of Acts, and he wrote a book in... Uh, to the first one, the gospel was written to Theophilus to present to him the truth that Jesus was the Christ. And this is a follow-up, and it says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. That's the first part of verse 2. So what did he begin to do when Jesus was here? What did he begin to do? <laughs> Rick's going to offer me his jacket, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. There we go. Now we're now we're cooking. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. All right. Um, so what did Jesus begin to do? And um, Matthew sixteen thirteen through. 20, you can turn there if you want, but that's the account of Jesus, and he comes to his apostles and he says, uh, what do men say that, that, that I am? Who do they say that I am? And, and he's like, it's basically, what, what is the word out there on the street of, you know, what are people, what's the, the hubbub of, of people talking about? He knew, but he wanted them to, to say what that was. And, and so he says to them, and, and they start to say, well, some of them say that you're John the Baptist. And some of them say that you're Elijah, and some say that maybe you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But then Jesus says, okay, it really doesn't matter to you what the rest of the people say. He says, I want to know who do you say that I am? And Peter correctly answers. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, that is correct. He said, and that's not a man's idea. He said, you learned that from God. God revealed that to you. And Jesus said, on that rock, the rock that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I am 
going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. And so I ask you the question, did Jesus build his church before he ascended to heaven? Did Jesus build his church before he ascended to heaven? The answer is no, he didn't build his church before he ascended to heaven. So we have here in the text that says what he began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. So he began, he set in motion the process of building his church by training the men who he would turn that process over to. He trained the apostles. They were going to be the ones that would start the church and begin to build it. He began it by training those men. He did not complete that work. And they, in turn, turned it over to those that they wanted to Christ, and they, in turn, turned it on. And we then carry on that mission. Jesus Christ, the thing that he began to do, he continues to do through you and through me. He builds his church through us. But again, how does he do that? It says he gave them instructions here before he was taken up in our verse until the day he was taken up from heaven, taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So he was taken up into heaven, and and, and you've often heard that somebody's last words, especially last words before they're dying, are ones that you want to pay attention to, but even more so, I would think, uh, last words of someone who's in charge, and they say, this is what I want you to do while I'm gone. You're going to want to pay attention to those words. And, and, and some of those words, those instructions that he gave before he was taken up are very familiar. And that is found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where he said, uh, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them into the name of, into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And so that was part of his instructions to them. He tells them to go into all the world. Go into all the world. And you're very familiar with that passage, but less familiar is is the rest of those instructions that he gave. And this is in Luke, and I do want you to turn there. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 51. Luke 24, 46 through 51. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you send to you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. So he, first of all, he tells them to go, but then he says, but wait, stay in Jerusalem until you've received power from on high. Stay until you're clothed with power from on high. And they were clothed by, and we'll see in Acts chapter 2 when we get there, Acts 1 and 2, that the Holy Spirit came on them. We all are clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit. At the moment that we're baptized into Christ, we receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, which at that time hadn't been given. The indwelling gift didn't come until the day of Pentecost. Again, we'll get there in a minute. So now turn with me back again to Acts, to our, our passage in Acts Picking it up in verse 3, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And the blank there is 40 days, and that will be relevant here in a minute. It will help us understand what's going on in the text. But notice that this is, this is part of the gospel. If you, if you remember in 1 Corinthians, and I didn't put this in your note, if you want to write this in your notes or, to remind yourself again where that is found, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, says that the gospel is that Jesus Christ was 
crucified on the cross for our sins. He died for our sins, according to scriptures. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to scriptures. And then it goes on to say that he, after that, he appeared to over 500 people. This is part of the gospel. Over 40 days, he proved that he was alive. That's part of the gospel, that he did that over a period of 40 days. And then we go down to verse 9, and verse 9 is, is, a, is a retelling of what was told in the passage in Luke that we just read, the uh, chapter 24, 46, or 51. This retells that same account, and it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. And so he's taken up, and he tells them to go into Jerusalem and wait until they receive the power. And so we ask the question, how did they receive this power? And as we continue to read on in the text, we'll find out exactly how that happened. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, uh, when suddenly men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And I don't, I don't know about you, but they, the angels probably would have the same thing, say the same thing to me. Because it's not every day that somebody just... Mm -hmm. Well, there he goes. <laughs> That's not a normal occurrence. I think I would have been standing there staring into the sky too. But, but the angel said, don't just stand there staring in the sky waiting for him to come back or seeing what's going to happen. There's work to do. He told you what to do next. So go ahead and do what he told you to do. And he's going to come back in that same way. He's going to come down from the sky. And that day is coming. And, and come quickly, Lord Jesus. I, I'm ready for that day. So, verse 12, they, they obeyed. They went, they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk. And in, in case you're wondering about that, um, just rock, walk to Rick and Carol's house. Um, you'll have a Sabbath day's walk. That is as far as they were allowed to walk on the Sabbath. About three quarters of a mile. There, there might be a hair longer than three quarters of a mile to there. But it's about that far to, to Rick and Carol. That's what a Sabbath day's mm -hmm. walk would be. And so, can you imagine? That's as far as you can go on the Sabbath. So anyway, they walked back. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas, of the son of James. And of course, you notice that Judas Iscariot is missing um, because he had... Uh, committed suicide, he's no longer part of the group. And that's going to be relevant here in a minute. They all joined together, all of these men joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And with his brothers. So they were joining together constantly in prayer, a group and verse 15, it says, In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. So 120, a group of about 120, joined together constantly in prayer. So they joined together there in a group, praying together. And so we won't go into reading this whole passage, but picking it up in verse 16 is the account of how the apostles replaced Judas. Judas wasn't there. They needed to have 12 apostles. They, they uh, set up two men. They, they talked about it, but I want to focus specifically on verse 24. <clears throat> in the middle of this 
in, uh, intense time of prayer, of group continuous prayer, they take time, at least part of the time, to pray specifically about the replacement of this leader. Verse 24, they, then they prayed, <clears throat> Lord, show, Lord, uh, Lord, you know everyone's heart, show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. And so they prayed about how to find their leaders, which their leaders. They had two men that met the qualifications. They had two men that met the qualifications of, of being an apostle, which was to have been with the group from the time of Jesus' baptism to the time of his resurrection. And that they had to be with him during that whole time. Oh, actually, until his ascension. And so they had to be part of that, had to be amongst the group, but not of the 12 chosen apostles. And so they pick Matthias because that's who God led them to pick. So prayer was part of the group as they waited on the Lord, as they waited for what he had promised, and then prayer was part of them picking the leadership of the church. Verse 1 of chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And this is where the 40 days becomes relevant because the day of Pentecost Penta, as you know, is pentagram, pentagon, that's where we get our uh, term for that. Five-sided, or five, 50 days is Pentecost. And Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. Jesus was crucified on Passover, and then he appeared alive on the earth for 40 days, and then ascended to heaven. They were there praying until the day of Pentecost. And this is, this is somewhat of a, a long quote. This is from uh, Max Lucado's book, Come Thirsty. It's an excerpt in a magazine article. And he, he does such a good job of painting the picture of what, what it might have been like there. And he said, um, can you imagine the apostles when, they were, when first Jesus tells them to go? But then he tells them to wait. He says, don't leave Jerusalem yet. Wait here for the Father to give you the Holy Spirit, just as I told you he, he has promised to do. Jesus' word to the disciples, wait. Before you go out, stand still. Prior to stepping forth, sit down. Stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. So they do. They went to the upstairs room, to the house where they were staying. They all met together continually for prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. They have reasons to leave. Some have businesses to run, or farms to feel, or <laughs> fields to farm, sorry. Besides, the same religious leaders and soldiers who killed Christ still walk the streets. The disciples have ample reason to leave. But they don't. They stay. And they all stay together. They all met together continually. As many as 120 huddled in the same house. One day passes, then two, then a week. For all they knew, a hundred more will come and go. And I'll just insert here, because Jesus didn't tell them how long they would be waiting. He just said, go wait. And waiting is almost always the hardest thing to do. Just wait. But they, aren't, they weren't leaving. They persisted in prayer and in waiting. Then ten days later, power came. And then, this is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. On the day of Pentecost, seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection, the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. Doubters became prophets. Peter preached and people came, and God opened the floodgates on the greatest movement in history. It began because the followers were willing to do one thing. Wait in the place, in the right place for power. We're so reluctant to do what they did. Who has time to wait? We groan at such a thought.
But waiting doesn't mean inactivity. Rather, it means in him activity. Waiting means watching. If you're watching, waiting for the bus, you're watching for the bus. If you are waiting on God, you are watching for God, searching for God, hoping in God. Great promises come to those who wait. It says in Isaiah 40, 31, but those who wait on the Lord will mount up on wings as eagles and they will fly high and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. To those who still struggle, God says, wait on me. Wait in the right place. Jesus doesn't tell us to stay in Jerusalem, but he does tell us to stay honest, stay faithful, stay true. For 10 days, the disciples prayed. 10 days of prayer plus a few minutes of preaching led to 3,000 souls saved. Perhaps we invert the numbers. We're prone to pray for a few minutes and then preach for 10 days. Not the apostles. They lingered in his presence. They never left the place of prayer. Biblical writers spoke often of this place. Early Christians were urged to pray without ceasing. Always be prayerful. Pray at all times on every occasion. Remember the adverb continually. That described the upper room prayer of the apostles. It is used to describe our prayers as well. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, Colossians 4.2. And so they're just waiting. Can you imagine waiting? Unended, open-ended, not knowing how many days, just waiting, waiting, waiting. But they were there, faithful in prayer, waiting. And after 10 days of continuous, concerted corporate prayer, the power of God came on them. It was after prayer that it came. And 10 days of prayer, as he said, followed by one sermon, led to 3,000 people getting saved. And it was interesting, we were part of a church in northern Illinois, and, and the, the leadership of the church had come across this article talking about a, another church that had grown tremendously. And, and the method that they had used was that the people in the church simply wore a little button that said, ask me, with those little round metal buttons that have the pen, and, you, and, you know, and it just said, ask me. And, 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 and people would go, well, well, ask you what? And they would say, well, ask me about Jesus. And so the people would say, well, what about Jesus? And so that would give them the opportunity to share the gospel. And, and so the leadership of that church said, well, if it worked for them, it'll, it'll work for us. And so they actually bought the little machine where you put those things together. They printed out the little ask me things and they assembled them all, stamped them all together. And everybody in the church, uh, and it was a church of about 350, and, and everybody in the church was wearing them. And, and, and at the end of the campaign, we had... No results. None. Zero. Well, what they missed in the article about the Ask Me button was that this congregation that had used the Ask Me button had prayed for three months. Three months they prayed before they put the buttons on and went out among the people. And so it wasn't the method. It was God answering their prayers. Yes, it took the prayer and the activity together. But we so often flip and focus just on the activity, on the action, on the doing, and we neglect the praying. And after these people prayed, we see the results. And then it says, after, and this uh, second chapter is all about that, is, is what happens after the power of the Holy Spirit came on them, how Peter proclaimed the gospel, the first gospel message recorded in Scripture, and how he shared what the people needed to do as they came and asked him, what must we do? And, and he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And, of course, that's Acts 2.38, but then we see what happens immediately after that when we look at what happens immediately following the 3,000 plus women and children that would have come to the to saving faith. We see what are the essential elements of the church, which are still the essential elements of the church today, and that's in chapter 2, verse 42. It says, when, after this, after the 3,000 came in verse 41, verse 42 says they devoted themselves, means they were committed to it, to the apostles' teaching, 
They were committed to the apostles' teaching, which is the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. They were committed to that. And they were committed to fellowship. And fellowship, fellowship, well, uh, it does happen here on Sunday mornings before church starts. And, and, and that's a, it's a great thing to hear the people interacting. And fellowship will happen around the potluck meal coming up on the 11th. But this word, the word fellowship here, actually has a more, a more of an intense meaning than that. And, and I don't know if you've notice the difference between the fellowship of, of just having a good time together and actually working on a project together and accomplishing the project together. It's a different kind of fellowship. It's a different kind of camaraderie. And that's what's being talked about here. The fellowship of partnership, of, of contributory help, of working together to an end goal. That's the kind of fellowship that they were committed to, is coming together to accomplish something for the kingdom of God. That was part of the essential elements of the church and breaking of bread. When it says, when it says the breaking of bread, that term in the Bible is used for the communion, for the Lord's Supper. That is a specific term. It doesn't just mean eating. Later in the text, it does say they met together daily in each other's homes and, and had fellowship over meals together. That was another element of it. But this specifically is remembering the Lord's Supper, the, the communion, what we do every week here. And then the last essential element to the church was prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, to corporate prayer. Praying together was part of the essential elements of the church, and they were committed to it. And then you can read down through there and you come to the end of verse 47, the last part of verse 47, and we see what happened when they were committed to these four things. It says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Wouldn't that be a glorious day to see the Lord adding daily to the kingdom through what we do here? We long for that day and we can pray towards that end. The Lord added daily. And it's interesting, the next uh, verse, verse 3, says one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. They had a daily time of prayer. They had a prayer time every day and they were on their way to go daily to the temple to pray. And, and we are looking and planning into the future of having a time of prayer. It won't be a daily time of corporate prayer, but we are, are going to have a regularly scheduled time of corporate prayer. And that will be coming in the future and we'll give you more details as those come. But this uh, next Sunday, the 28th, we will be having a time of prayer after the, the Bible study. Uh, on Sunday night, and we'll be having a time of prayer specifically for the upcoming Creation Truth event, and we've put a handout in your bulletin, and you can begin praying these things now ahead of time uh, in your daily times of prayer. You can start to pray for that event, that the Lord will use that event uh, for, for His kingdom's sake, and then we'll have that united time of prayer next Sunday evening. And verse, picking it up to verse 2, of chapter 3, uh, going all the way through um, verse 17, is the account of Peter and John. They're on their way to the temple. A uh, lame man is being brought in who's been brought there every day and laid there and just waiting for some to give him some money. And they see him and they heal him. And, and the healing of this man is obviously a miracle. And everybody's like, whoa, this guy's been lame. I mean, I grew up my whole life. Every day I pass by, there he is. There he is. There he is. There he is. Now he's walking around, jumping up and down, praising the Lord. What's going on? And so they come together and, and Peter uses that opportunity to preach the gospel to them. And, and if, if you read the text, he, he wasn't playing. He says, this, how did this guy get healed? It's in the name of Jesus, whom you crucified. You killed him. God brought him back to life, and it's in his power that we healed this guy. And so the people are, are, are just drawn to that, and they're preaching the resurrection. The Sadducees aren't happy about the fact that they're preaching the resurrection because the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So the Sadducees haul them in, and they question them, and they say, how, what's going on here? Peter again, 
Well, if that Jesus, whom you crucified, who God brought back to life in his name and in his power, we healed this guy. And so they're not real happy about this because there they are teaching the resurrection and talking about Jesus and everybody's going after them. And so they're trying to figure out what to do. The Sanhedrin and, and the religious leaders are trying to figure out what to do. And they couldn't. They're like, everybody knows that this miracle happened. This guy's dancing around. We can't get him to be quiet. And... And then one of the things that they notice in verse 13 of chapter 4 says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. And if they could only say that about us. Wow. I don't know what else about that guy, but I can tell he's been around Jesus. And I just I pray that that's what they would say about me and about all of us. They've been around Jesus. And so they continue to question him, them, and then in verse 18, they called them in and again, it commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And so there they are, they're being threatened. They're like, we should punish these guys, we should whip them, we should put them in prison, but then there's going to be a riot because everybody knows that they did this miracle, and so we'll just threaten them. And so they threatened him. So how did Peter and John respond to that threat? Verse 19, Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So I, I would say they, they politely stood up to them. I, I don't get the sense that they were cocky or arrogant or condescending to these guys. They just said, hey, you know, you decide. Should we listen to you or should we listen to God? But we cannot help talking about what we've seen and heard. And is that what's the testimony of your life? I can't help but talk about what Jesus has done for me. And, and, and I've said it before and I'll say it again. If Jesus hadn't have saved my life, I would have either been dead or in prison years ago because I wasn't a very nice guy. But Jesus saved. Jesus changed me. He, he, he's molded. He's continuing to change me. There's still things that he needs to do in me. And he continues to change me. And I'm so thankful for him and what he's done for me and how he's changed me. And, and I want to, to, to just continue to grow to where I get to the point where I can't help but talk about Jesus. Is that where we are? Well, they, they say that, and then verse 21, after further threats, they let them go. They couldn't decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So what do they do next? What is their response after they've been threatened again and released? Verse 23, on their release... Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So they went back to the church. They went to church. They went to where the body of Christ was meeting. They went back and, and they went to give them a report of what had happened. And did they give them that report um, so that they could complain? Oh, you can't believe what happened to us. Those guys, those... Uh, those religious leaders, we were trying to do a good thing and they, they shut us down. Or did, did they go there to have a pity party and to get sympathy? Did they go there so that everyone would be afraid and, and, and be quiet? No. Verse 24. When they heard, when they, the church, heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They informed all of these people so that they could pray, so that they could pray intelligent prayers, so that they could pray informed prayers. They wanted the people to back them up in prayer. They prayed. But look, it matters who we pray to. Look what it says. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, 
You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David. And I'll just stop there and say, look at who they're praying to. They're praying to the sovereign Lord. They're praying to the one who is in control. They're like, we know. These guys are threatening us. They're telling us to be quiet. But we know that you're the one in charge. You're in control. They're not in control. We're not in control. We're praying to the God who has it under control. If you're praying to that God, you can trust him. And then they go on. They say, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Hmm. Peter and John absolutely believed that the world, the universe, the seen, known world was created, spoken into existence, out of nothing, by God. Satan, on the other hand, doesn't want people to know and understand that. He's deceived the whole world into thinking that it's happened over time, over millions of years. Did it happen? Did Jesus Christ speak it into existence? Or did it happen by itself over time, over millions of years? Because Satan doesn't want people to know the true and living God and praise him for what he's done. So he says, uh, all this came into existence without a God, without his help, without him creating it. And that's one of the reasons we're bringing Ryan and Creation Truth in, is, is to see how those two things go together. How does creation, how does the Word of God, how do they go together? How does science and, and all of that, is one true and one not true? How do they go together? What do they say about one another? We want to know the one true and living God, the one who spoke it all into existence. Then it says that he spoke... You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant and your father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And so that was a prophecy. The God who spoke, the God who fulfills prophecy, which again is part of the gospel of, if, in the Corinthians. Again, it says that Jesus died on the cross according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to scripture. It's part of the gospel that our God can predict the future. He's the only one who can. He's the only one who can tell the future, and he can tell it exactly, and he can call people by name who haven't even been born yet. He, that's the God that's the God they're praying to. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand would happen. That's our God. And, and, and it's hard to wrap your mind around the free will of man and the sovereignty of God, but there's a couple of things that... that kind of remotely sort of help you understand this. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with martial arts, but a lot of what happens in martial arts is you use the other person's movements against them. As they, they take a swing at you, you just emphasize that swing and throw them on the ground. Grab them and take it and help, it, help that momentum continue. And so you, they have free will on how they're acting against you, how they're coming at you, but you, having more skill, more training, more knowledge, are using their free will to your advantage. And if a mere man can do that in martial arts, what about the God of the universe who created it all? Can he do that? And, and, and then also in chess, and, and I, I'm eh at chess, I'm okay at it. <laughs> but there was a couple of young men at one of the churches that we attended that loved to play chess, and, and I, I watched them, they set it all up, and the, the one young man set things up in such a way that the opponent, would, they would have to trade queens. That his opponent would take out his queen, and then he would immediately take out his, the other opponent's queen. But he set that all up. He used the other team, the other opponent's free will to accomplish his purpose. And once the queens were off the board, so, like me, I rely too heavily on my queen. She has lots of moves. I don't know how familiar you are with chess. But once you get that off the board, now. It's more equal, and he went on to win the game. But if we, again, if mere men can use the opponent's movements to their advantage, their free will, their choice, if we can do that, how much more can God use the free will of men to accomplish his purposes? 
predicted hundreds and thousands of years before. Now, verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, the Lord that we had just described, the one who is sovereign creator, fulfiller of prophecies. And, and if you'll notice this pattern here, does it sound familiar? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's what they've done here. They've expounded on that. They've hallowed the name of the Father. They've glorified him. They've exalted him. They've taken that hallowed be thy name, and that's what they've done. They've expanded it. They've said, this is the God that we pray to. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And there it is. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here they're asking the Lord. They've hallowed the name of the Lord. Now they're asking for his will to be done. Enable your servants to speak your word with boldness. Consider their threats. And help us to be more bold. May we have that mindset. Jesus built his church. We see right here that Jesus built his church through prayer and boldness. It takes both things. And I wish, I wish William was here to tell this. Uh, we were in a board meeting a, a few weeks ago. And they had been to the National Conference of, of Bible Translators in Dallas, in Texas. And all the different Wycliffe and Pioneer Bible Translators and all the different Bible translation uh, organizations had come together for this national conference. And, and the, the moderator of the conference was up and he was making this observation that, that uh, Wycliffe and the other organizations, their, their numbers of missionaries were steadily declining. And the, the amount of work that they've been able to accomplish is also declining. And, and, they, and they, they, the moderator basically said, all of the work of Bible translating is declining, except for pioneer Bible translators. Their numbers are increasing, and their work is increasing. And so one of the delegates there said, well, ask them what they're doing. And so they did, and, and the answer came back. They said, they asked, what is your strategy? What is your strategy that's working? And the answer that came back was, our strategy is prayer. Our strategy is prayer. That was it. And because of their prayers, because of asking God to do more work through them, he's answering that prayer. And they said also, and we have not allowed technology to remove us from the villages. We still live among the people. We're not doing it from outside looking in. We're living among the people, praying and living among the people. And Jim Cimbala, who is the, uh, the, the pastor of uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle Church in New York, in his book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, he account, recounts how that church came to be. And he was, he was ministering in nearby uh, New Jersey and was asked to come in and help this church that was dying. And he goes into Brooklyn, which is in the heart of New York. And he goes in and he goes into the church building. And there's five members of that church when he arrived, and, and he goes into the church building, and the windows are broken, and water's pouring in through the ceilings, and, and, and he's just like, wow, really? <laughs> really, Lord? And so he begins to preach there. Nothing is happening, and nothing is happening, and, and, and I don't, it's been a while since I read the book, and I don't remember if he was out on a boat or if he was on a dock, but he's looking out over the railing, out over the bay, and he's weeping because of the things that are not happening in his church. And he's like, Lord, what do I, what do I do? What do I do? And he said it was just clear as could be that the Lord said to him, I build my church through prayer. And it was at that moment that he decided that prayer was going to be the most important meeting of the week. And he started a Tuesday night prayer meeting. And he was faithful to pray. And over time, more and more people joined that meeting. And, and, and the, that group grew. And, and that church today is a church of over 10,000 people in the heart of New York. And if you've ever heard any of the music from the Brooklyn Tabernacle Singers, that's an outworking of that ministry, of that prayer that one man and his wife decided that we're going to obey the Lord and we're going to pray fervently for this church. 
That meeting today is still one of the most important meetings of that congregation. They have thousands of people that come to their prayer meeting. And, and he testifies to the fact that in the middle of that meeting one night, they had a daughter who was far from the Lord, far from the Lord, living a worldly life. Nothing to do with Christ and his kingdom. And, and their hearts were broken for her. And, and that was part of the regular prayer time on that Tuesday night prayer meeting. And they would pray for her and weep. And one night, in the middle of the Tuesday night prayer meeting, she walks through the doors, returning home, returning to the Lord. The power of prayer. The power of prayer. Continuing on here, verse 30. This is continuing their prayer. I'll back up to 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch your hand to heal and to perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant. And I'll just take just a second here. That in chapter 2, verse 20, 42, it says that the miracles and signs and wonders at that time were being done through the apostles. And what, we, what I see in Scripture, and, and if you have more questions about this, you can ask me, is that the miracles in the Bible were done by, the, by Jesus, the apostles, and those they laid their hands on. We have no other record of any other people performing miracles. And so you might ask, well, how is this relevant to us today? How is that relevant if we can't perform miracles today? And what, how is that relevant? And does Jesus miraculously heal today? Absolutely, 100%. I have testimonies of people being completely, miraculously healed by prayer. But I don't have any examples of anybody with the gift of healing. I have no cultural, no matter what they say, no matter what they claim, and those guys on TV, if you look closer, it's not really miraculous healings. So how is this relevant? How is this relevant to us? Well, in Matthew chapter... I lost my reference. But in Matthew chapter 16, I believe it is, Jesus says... Um, that you will do greater works than he No, John 14, there it is, I found my notes. In John 14, 12, Jesus said he would do, we, that those who come after him would do greater works than he did. Because he was going to the Father and sending the Spirit. So if we can't do those miracles, what is the greater work that we can do? What is the greater work? Well, if you think about it, any miracle, any physical miracle, even physical miracles that Jesus did were temporary. Even if you raise somebody from the dead, even like Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, he died again. Those are temporary. The lame man, he walked until he died. But we have the opportunity to participate with God, with the Holy Spirit, in bringing people to salvation. And there is no greater miracle than taking someone from death to life, from eternal death to eternal life. We get to work the greater miracles, the greater work of sharing the gospel. That is the greater work. And we can pray about that today. We can say, we can pray, we can say, consider their threats, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness, stretch forth your hand to bring people to Christ. May that be our prayer. May we, as we come together as a church, pray that. And then, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And I just pray that the Lord would shake us that we would speak the word of God boldly. Lord, Father, shake this place. Let's pray.